The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. Our topic today, reshaping nuclear policy. Much of the media coverage of nuclear policy issues today centers on the nuclear program in North Korea and Iran's presumed quest for a bomb. In the months ahead, however, U.S. policymakers will face historic decisions about our own atomic arsenal. With a changing security environment and the price tag for nuclear weapons and related programs projected at over $640 billion over the next 10 years, some have suggested it's time to rethink America's nuclear policy. To help, us, to help us explore the nuclear debate facing the second Obama administration, we're pleased to be joined by one of our nation's leading authorities on nuclear policy. Joseph Cerencion is president of Plowshares Fund, a public foundation supporting nonproliferation and the elimination of nuclear weapons. He's the author of Bomb Scare, The History and Future of Nuclear Weapons, and Deadly Arsenals, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Threats. He's also a member of the Secretary of State's International Security Advisory Board. Joe, welcome back to International Focus. Thank you, Rob. Pleasure to be here. Well, Joe, I know you've obviously been around these issues for a long time. You've probably seen all the angles. You've seen the uh -huh. trends come and go. And normally, when we talk about this issue, we talk about why should we or what should we do? And given the history of this issue, I guess I want to come at it from the other way and say, why haven't we? Uh -huh. um, yes. What is it that's really standing in our way? And are we really at a moment we might be seeing a, a different kind of traction, a different kind of momentum here yeah. than, we, than, we, than we have in the past. What, what do you see as one of the key issues about why we haven't yeah. made more progress on the nuclear issue? Great question. I'm, I'm, great way to talk about this. I have to give a, a disclaimer right away, though. Even though I'm on the Secretary of State's International Security Advisory Board, I do not speak for the Secretary of the State Department. The views I express here are, are strictly my sure. own. So I, I think you have contending forces right now on propping up the, the nuclear arsenal. It's, it's a vestige of the Cold War. We've been, the Soviet Union disappeared 20 years ago, and still both the United States and, and Russia have in the vicinity of uh, 5,000 weapons in their active stockpile, plus a couple thousand more held in reserve. We have 2,000 weapons on missiles ready to launch at a moment's notice. The Russians have the same, still basically the Cold War posture. So why? What keeps this going? I think there's several factors. One is ideology. So there are some who believe that these are essential weapons that we need in a dangerous world. So even though you have threats from, say, North Korea or Iran, North Korea has a, maybe six nuclear weapons, Iran doesn't have any, and these countries have thousands, still that insecurity tends to prop up the maintenance of, of a large Isn't arsenal. generational? Joe, I mean, is that Increasingly, it is, and that's, it's interesting. So you see even in the debate over Senator Chuck Hagel's nomination, you see it's more the, 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 the older politicians who are making this argument, and the, and the younger politicians are standing a little apart from it. So this, is an, this ideological argument is losing saliency in today's world. The second uh, reason is political. I would say if we had a Republican president right now, we would have a smaller nuclear arsenal. Well, that, that's, that, that, I think this is <clears throat> this is a really interesting thing about about yeah. the Obama administration is those that would argue on the political side that that it's a Democrat could never make significant reductions because they'll just play into hey. Democrats, you're soft on, right. on defense. Right. And historically, Republicans have attacked Democrats for being weak on defense, and Democrats have attacked Republicans for gutting Social Security. So these are traditional lines of attack. So any defense, any defense issue becomes a spear in this attack, whether it's Benghazi or an arms control agreement. It's all becomes very partisan in today's atmosphere. It's very hard, even though 
Republicans have done exactly what Obama is proposing, deep reductions, negotiations with the Russians, talk to the North Koreans, uh, make unilateral reductions even. George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush both made massive unilateral reductions in the nuclear arsenal. They weren't attacked for doing it because the Democrats supported it. Right. Republicans went along. When it's a Democratic president, you see the politics come into play. And the, uh, the final reason, I think, is, is, is jobs. This, at its root, is still a jobs and contracts program. So you have three ICBM bases, intercontinental ballistic missile bases, spread out over five states. They have 400, 450 ICBMs. This is a Cold War force. It's a Cold War weapon. What requires you to have 450 ICBMs in today's world? Well, nothing, really. Could you do with 300? Could you do it 150? Yes, but to do that, you've got to close some of those bases. The states don't want the bases closed. Groton up, up in New London wants to keep building uh, uh, submarines. Uh, bomber bases want to keep the bombers there. So you see this is really becomes a jobs and contracts issue. All three of those things, ideology, politics, jobs and contracts, prop up uh, a nuclear force that is really uh, obsolete in the 21st century. If, if um, uh, so, so if we have, if we're talking about ideology, uh, 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 jobs, and, and and politics, maybe we can start to look at what are some of the cracks in the foundation. In yeah. other words, are, are are we starting to see uh, signs that that tides are turning? We're hitting tipping points, maybe yeah. on one or more of those issues. So we talked a little bit about the ideology piece. Maybe you can get just to cover that off a bit. So so that it, you know you have now a, a public. That is, um, uh, where, where you know people are now coming into their twenties have have grown up in the Osama bin Laden era and the post 9/11 era, and and they're not hiding under their desks and 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 nuclear drills anymore. What's the impact of, of, of that shift? Not just the shift of the older politicians, but also the, the shift of the public. Well, in, in fact, when you when you poll the public, the public is overwhelmingly in favor of eliminating nuclear weapons. Eliminating them, you get you get seventy percent saying no country should have these, including us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you get a, a higher numbers for sharp reductions. When you tell people how many weapons we have, that we have 5,000 hydrogen bombs, you know, overwhelmingly the public wants to get rid of them. And the younger demographic, the younger part of that, the 18 to 34, they're more in favor than, than the, the, the older population. So you do see that. And, of course, it doesn't make any sense in today's world. Nuclear weapons have almost nothing to do with the real security threats we faced, uh, terrorism, cybersecurity, unrest in the, in the Middle East, women's rights, climate change. You know, there's, there's nothing that, that, that we're actually dealing with that requires at least the size of the nuclear arsenal, I would argue, any nuclear weapons. But you could certainly do more, do, do it less with fewer nuclear weapons. Still, that might be compensated by the inertia, the bureaucratic inertia that keeps it alive if it weren't for one thing, which is the budget crisis. We are now in a fiscal crisis in this country. We're in a budget crisis. The government budget is coming down. The defense budget is coming down. It's, we, we doubled the defense budget over the last 10 years since 9-11. People don't realize how much the budget came. Uh, when you say double, give us a sense of absolute dollars. Well, so we, it's about 450 uh, it's about five. Billion. It's about 540 billion dollars a year now. That's almost double what it was in, before 9-11, just for the Pentagon budget. Plus, you then roll in Department of Energy, nuclear, which does right. most of the nuclear weapons, um, veterans' benefits. All told, we spend about $700 billion a year on the military, which is a whole lot of money. That's coming down. When it comes down, now the Joint Chiefs have to make choices. In an expanding pie, everybody can have a slice. Now you have to choose, and when the Joint Chiefs are asked to choose, they don't choose nuclear. They want tanks and planes and ships, things that deal with the real threats that they have. And this is causing now pressure on the nuclear budget. You mentioned in the opening, we're set to spend $640 billion on the next 10 years on nuclear weapons and related programs. Missile defense programs alone are going to cost $100 billion. And this is just the beginning. And here's the real fiscal crunch that's going to cause politicians to step back and take a look. It's that over the next two to four years, we're going to be making 50-year decisions whether we're going to replace the existing triad 
of missiles, submarines, and bombers, all of which are aging, reaching the end of their operational life in the next decade. Do we replace that with a whole new generation that would last for 50 years? To do that, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. Is that where you want to put your money? Um, Joe, when, you're, when you, you've talked to people on Capitol Hill and, and uh, you're, you're encountering any of these three objections, either the, the political arguments or the, the, the ideological arguments, you know, sort of security policy arguments, <clears throat> or the, the jobs and, and economics type argument, what, what do you hear is the primary drivers from, from folks on Capitol Hill? Well, so there's camps on Capitol Hill, so it, it breaks up. One of the interesting things you're seeing now, and you've seen commenters talk about this, is that in the conservative camp, you know, there's a split between the defense hawks and the budget hawks. So the Tea Party people are much more concerned about government spending, including military spending, and about deficits where the, 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 the defense hawks want to keep a large military, want to increase defense spending. So in that defense hawk camp, there'll be nuclear hawks. So the Heritage Foundation, a very conservative foundation, they want to increase the number of nuclear weapons we have. We have about... Uh, about 1,700 operational strategic warheads right now, long-range weapons. They want to increase that to 3,000, almost double. You know, that's a, a definitely a minority. And when that conservative view hits this other conservative view that says, well, who's going to pay for that? It turns out the budget hawks are now starting to, to win that argument. And then that's amplified by the, the Democrats in Congress are all now on board with rationalizing the nuclear force and finding budget savings there. So Carl Levin, the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, says the nuclear budget is ripe for cuts. We have far more weapons than we need. Uh, Adam Smith, the ranking Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee, after the president's State of the Union address where he talked about nuclear policy, he, you know, he said we can maintain our security at lower levels and reap major budget savings. So everybody's out looking for that billion dollars, $10 billion, $100 billion that they can share from the budget, nuclear weapons are an obvious place to look. We've got it just a minute before the, the break, John. I, I wonder if, if this is sort of a, a, a maybe more kind of an inside baseball kind of question, yeah. but th what's the role of Congress? I mean, in other words, we've, we've seen well, more and more being done by the Obama administration by through executive order on, on yeah. key issues like guns and, and other things. What room is there for this to be done by the White House directly, or, or must, we, must it all go through Congress? That is a really interesting question, and that is going to be a key issue over the next couple of months. And it's one of the reasons you saw so much criticism of Chuck Hagel for his positions. This man who's about to be Secretary of Defense, he's in favor of cutting the nuclear budget. He was accused of unilateral disarmament, not his position. You know, not, not going to give these things away while, while other people have them. But he is in favor of considering unilateral reduction, having the executive branch, the president, just cut the force. That you heard the conservatives in the Senate Armed Services Committee giving a shot across the bow, warning him not to do that. The executive can do this if they want, and it's a political battle um, between the, the, the Congress and the executive branch, whether they will. We're going to uh, take a break. Uh, we'll, we'll be back in just a moment, International Focus. And when we come back, Joe, I want to want to come back to the jobs question and see if there's some, some okay. traction on that as well. We'll okay. be back in just a moment on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking with Joseph Cerencion of the Plowshares Fund about nuclear policy questions. And, and Joe, before the, the break, you, 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 you flag the, the jobs issue, yeah. you know, that, that, that uh, we're, we're talking about uh, contracts to produce nuclear components and new generations of nuclear weapons to maintain bases. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a big chunk, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it has an economic impact uh, as well. Uh, I'm wondering... Uh, to what extent are we, you know, is that, is that the, uh, the reason why nothing's going to happen? Is there anything we can do on that front? Well, you have 
states with different interests. So Wisconsin, for example, doesn't benefit much from nuclear contracts, nuclear programs. No bombers, missiles, subs uh, based or built in Wisconsin. Some other states with the bases include Montana, North Dakota, uh, Wyoming, or with labs, nuclear laboratories like uh, California or New Mexico, or shipyards like in New London, Connecticut. So you s there'll be a, a contest between these states, and that, that gets played out in the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Committee. Uh, over the last couple of years, as the c budget starts to come down, you see nuclear programs um, being axed more than in, and in favor of preserving funds for conventional programs. I think that trend is just beginning. And part of the reason is they have so little justification. You know, why do you need to build a factory to build more warheads now? Do you really need to replace all the nuclear submarines we have? How about half the fleet, you know? Can you do with fewer bombers? Can you not have a bomber at all? These are the kinds of questions that are going to be uh, debated in Congress over the next uh, two to four years. Um, when uh, we, we talked a little bit about what people on Capitol Hill are saying, so what do you hear from people in in the militaries, in, in the bran in the service branches, uh, in terms of what they? So I if they're facing yeah. the reality that there are going to be budget cuts, whether it's sequestration, which will be sort of quick and dramatic, or it'll be some longer term but but steady decline in the budget, what are they saying about how they're going to cope with this? Historically, the Joint Chiefs have wanted to preserve conventional assets, so they want the sh the ships, the planes. Uh, uh, the, the, to to do the the threats to deal with the threats they're actually facing, and as long as the pie is expanding, it's okay. We spread it around, but with the contracting pie, choices have to be made. And you see this reflected in the advice that the Joint Chiefs are giving the president. So there's been some news stories recently that the president has decided that we can cut the nuclear force uh, dramatically, actually. The treaty that we negotiated with the Russians allows us to have 1,550, 1,550 deployed long-range weapons. It looks like the president and the Joint Chiefs are saying, well, we can do with uh, 1,000. You know, we can cut that by almost a third. And the chiefs have signed off on this because that's, you know, that's just the reality of the world. What, what possible military mission requires a thousand hydrogen bombs? So, you know, cut, even making a cut like that still gives you more than, than you need. And, and that's where you see military leaders, national security leaders going. And they're much more concerned that, the, that these weapons are a liability to us, not an asset, that a terrorist could get a weapon from an insecure stockpile in, in Russia or from Pakistan and use it against us, that new states like North Korea or Iran will want to develop these weapons. And that's the real threat. There's too many of these weapons, not enough. There, there, I've heard some uh, current and former military talking about, hey, you know, maybe uh, cuts in the defense budget is, is going to really force us to reevaluate our whole security posture, and that maybe, maybe they're trying to put a, uh, a spin on, on something that's going to be painful for, for the defense community, but that, that, um, that this may be the push to say, well, maybe we should abandon some of these old policies, including the, the nuclear policy, I mean, in terms of doctrine. I mean, do, do, you, do you see the, this, is, this could be a, not just a tactical sort of moving around of budget items, but actually a, a fundamental oh, yeah. shift? Oh, you know, just think about the shows you do. Yeah. I mean, how often in the shows you do yeah. do nuclear weapons come up? Right. And that is just not the, 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 the currency of great power anymore. It's not a guarantee of security, you know. It's not a prestige item. We, we used to live in a world, when you and I were born, you know, in the, in the middle of the 20th century, where chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, all the great powers were building these arsenals. We've already seen chemical weapons go by the wayside. No power uh, ad admits to having these weapons. Their presence in Syria is, of course, a, a scandal, of course, a concern. It doesn't give prestige or security to Syria. Biological weapons. Richard Nixon eliminated the biological weapons stockpile unilaterally, just said this is not in our interest to get rid of them. You see nuclear go in the same way. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll see the elimination in our lifetime, but definitely the reduction, reducing the role and number in, in global security issues. And you see increasingly the, the bipartisan consensus in this country saying we don't need these weapons. They're not a security asset. They're a liability. This is something that's happening. You can, you can see it happening. It's a question of whether it goes fast enough to get rid of these weapons before something terrible happens. Sam Nunn likes to say we're in a race between cooperation and catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And it's an open question which will win.
Um, so, so if we if we um, think about the, I mean, you you talked about the 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 the, the people of our generation, we're going up sort of the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe, we, did, we did duck and cover drills. Uh, yeah, you know? exactly. We remember this stuff. We saw Dr. Strangelove, we saw, you know, and Godzilla and all the movies that had atomic themes to them. Well, that's that's the past, man. But, that That is decades ago now. At, at the risk of forcing you to be a, a psychologist here, um, but there was also a, a, a part of that time which was almost this nuclear weapons as the security blanket. Oh, yes. You know, that, that you know, is that what make, makes it hard for, for yeah. lots of people to sort of make that jump to say, let's think about, uh, if not re elimination, at least significant reduction? Well, it's, it's very interesting. Outside of Washington, in this, in the, or outside of the Congress, let's be more specific, there's, there's a broad consensus in the national security establishment that we can do with far fewer nuclear weapons. And there's even a growing consensus that we don't really need any of these at all. But in the Congress, you see resistance to this ideologically, politically, and because the contracts. You know, people whose states benefit from these contracts, they're keeping to, to they're, they're propping them up. So, you, so Congress is sort of the last vestige of this Cold War complex that preserved this arsenal. I think that it's shrinking, it's, it's losing. And when you go outside, when you go to uh, universities, when you go to think tanks, you know, the, 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 the feeling that these are essential to our national security is just fading, fading away. Well, let's talk about that, that, that aspect of this. We talked a lot about Washington, the Congress, yeah. the administration, uh, uh, particularly the military views. Um, I'm sure plowshares, uh, through plowshares, you, you, you engage publics, you engage yeah. communities and, and, and the, the media and so on. Um, what 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 can people do on that front? So if we, if we switch the focus now to, to, to people who are watching the show or, or maybe reading some of the, the the news reports on this issue, how how can people engage with this with this question? Sure. Well, one is just stay informed. You know, you can come to the Plowshares web shop, website, or you can go to some of the think tanks that you that you read about and read some of the reports. Follow a little bit of what's going on. Second, let your representatives know where you stand. That, that if you're in favor of cutting the budget or you don't want to cut the budget, this is an area where you can make cuts safely and preserve American security. Let, let them know that. And uh, I would say that the third is to engage in, in the kind of community discussions that we, we still have, whether it's on websites or in the newspaper, letters to the editor, columns that are being written, call-in shows, you know, engage in this. This, isn't, this is not one of the major issues anybody watching this show is going to deal with, but it is a major issue. It is one of the big policy um, uh, issues for this uh, administration. President Obama sees this as not only a necessary security issue he wants to deal with, but a legacy issue. This is part of what he wants to be remembered for. So it's going to play prominently this year in our national security and foreign policy, and probably through the next four years of this term, Americans, who, uh, citizens who care about this should, should find ways to get involved and let their voices be heard. So in other words, this, this is another reason why this may be the moment or may be a moment to, to really do this is because you now have an administration that's particularly positioned to and, want to take and this what on. we do over the next two or three years is going to determine which way the policy goes. So, you know, it's like a steam liner. People often talk about this. You know, national security. You turn it in a certain direction. You know, and that's what you have to do. And for some of your viewers, they may want to support some of the groups that are doing this work. Plowshares Fund raises money, and we find the best people with the smartest ideas, and we give them grants to help them do their work. You know, people should consider putting not just their voices behind their concerns, but some of their money behind their concerns. There are a lot of good groups out there uh, doing really fine work on this. And, and the other, and again, the, very immediately, we have the, 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 the budget issues coming up with sequestration and so on. And we were talking about a, a trillion, perhaps in budget reduction over the next 10 years. Yeah. We've thrown the, the number around of 640 billion related nuclear. I mean, so, so this should be a, yeah. A it key is. part of this discussion. Right. So you can't save $640 billion. You just can't. Even you if can't we eliminated eliminate them tomorrow, yeah. you need whatever, whenever, as long as you have nuclear weapons, you want them to be safe. Yeah. You don't want them to go off when you don't want to, you know. And you, there's a, a lot of that money that we're talking about is environmental costs. There's a lot of cleanup that we'll have to do. Um, some of it is, you, you're going to need some of that money. But... Uh, some of our groups have calculated you can save $120 billion over the next 10 years right off the top. 
not by so eliminating just fruit, right, mean. just by delaying some of these new bomber programs, new new submarine programs, not modernizing every warhead in the arsenal, just scaling things back. You can easily save 120 billion over the next 10 years. That's real money that you could be using for either conventional weapons that you need or social programs that you need. So this is a real fight. There's real stakes at this. It's not just ideological. It's not just, you know, beyond your thinking. It's an obscure debate. We're talking money here and who gets it. So the uh, so immediately, um, if, if we direct people to the Plowshares website, other other things that they can do, uh, be in touch with the members of Congress, uh, letting their uh, writing to the president. I mean, the, the, is what's the we've got about a minute left, Joe. What, what what are the key moments over the next few years? What are we, what are we looking at time frame wise? There's, there's budget debates. There's political debates over whether the president gets to put in place the nominees that he wants. When the president announces that he's going to reduce the nuclear arsenal, he's going to get attacked for it. You know, people have to stand up and, and defend the kind of views, if they support them, that the, the president has. So you want to be heard. You want to, you know, have your voice heard. And just, just saying that, you know, politicians are a very timid lot. And they want to know that the people back home support them when they, when they take these positions. So I, I used to work in Congress for 10 years. Believe me, they read these letters. They read these emails. They pay attention to them. Great. Joe Cerencioni, Plus Years Fund, thank you very much for being back with us on International Focus and talking nuclear policy to our viewers. We'll see you next week on International Focus. Great. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 